So you're gonna do thumbs up. Should I do thumbs up like that? I'm Joy and I am the managing editor at Five Cent Sound. Hi everyone, my name's Ashley. I'm the editor in chief of Five Cent Sound. And today we are doing a very special interview with Harrison Whitford. Uh, I'm Harrison and I am a musician. So this album that you're releasing this month is very quintessentially November to me. When I listened to it, that's what I got. I got very fall vibes. Um, I could like picture myself driving in New England to like see my family for Thanksgiving. So I wanted to know when you recorded it and also when you wrote it originally. Time yeah. for it. Yeah, I wrote a handful of them like November 2019, funny, funny enough. And then recorded a lot of them like end of November, December 2019. And it was just going to be an EP. It was just going to be like a five or six song EP. Over the course of the pandemic, I thought that I maybe would just add some more songs and, and make it a record because it felt more exciting to me to maybe just put a whole record out instead of an EP. I, it's funny you say that because I kind of, I think naturally, you know, I live in LA now and I'm from Massachusetts originally and grew up there and I and I lived in New York too I grew up in New York also and, and then I lived in Nashville and um I think that you know even though I live in LA the the sort of the feeling of seasons and the like different things we consume seasonally is still very much something I I think about sort of subconsciously I guess so I'm I'm usually a like, you know, generally attracted to things that I feel like are um, like sonically or, or artistically, no, you know, November-ish or fall-ish. So I always thought that, I, that if I did put it out at some point, it would be nice to put it out when it is coming out, which is cool. So it's, it's cool that you feel that way. It was so cool to listen to because I was just like looking out my window and I was like, this matches perfectly. And like back to your comment about living in other places and always having like that seasonal feeling. I've like thought about like, oh, like maybe one day, like I'll end up in LA or something. But then I'm like, wait, can I actually depart with like not having seasons since I'm from or, Massachusetts? It's crazy. In many ways, it is it is a, you know, dramatic departure, but it's also, like, you still do sort of get the sense out here where it's just, it's all, it's so, it's so hot, and then all of a sudden, it's, like, kind of, kind of chilly, and it never gets, like, truly cold or anything, but it's, like, it changes enough that you still are reminded that there are seasons, but it's not quite the same thing. It does spoil you. Like, I don't think I want to go back to the, 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 uh, the former, but... <laughs> Right, if you don't have to pull out those jackets and you don't have to deal, especially with like the gross snow here. Ugh. Yeah, the only thing I do miss is when I lived in those places, like I would maybe even make more music during those months just because I was inside so much. So I wanted to ask, um, obviously you've done a lot of songwriting, not only for yourself, but for other artists as well. And I kind of wanted to gauge, does your songwriting process differ when you're writing songs for other artists versus ones for yourself? And how do you decide what songs are going to be offered to others and which ones will be kept solely for you, whether it be released or unreleased? That's an interesting question. It definitely is a different process when you're writing with somebody else because, you know, your combined tastes and like views of the world are coming up against each other. So there's like an inevitable, not, you know, I don't want to use the word compromise, but there is kind of an inevitable compromise that gets made, but it's not necessarily a negative thing. It's just, it's just a compromise. It's the compromise that comes with collaborating is that when you're collaborating with somebody, you have to listen to them. You know, you have to make sure that it, it is this dance of like your idea and their idea, you know? So a lot of the times, I, usually when I'm in the context of writing with somebody else, I'm usually more just comp contributing musical ideas. Songwriters lyrically, they like what they like very specifically. And it can be tricky to write lyrics with somebody. You know, like times that I've written with Phoebe is different where you can contribute an idea, but she'll eventually, you know, decide on whichever lyric she likes the most. And then, I've written a bunch of songs with my friend Matt Burning, who's the singer of that band, The National. 
and he that's just music because Matt's only a singer and a lyricist so he doesn't even play an instrument so you just basically write like a song form you know you write just kind of a song form and you give it to him and then he writes lyrics and, and a melody over it and then when I'm writing by myself it's just compulsive it's just like if I happen to sit down at the piano or something and, and get an idea you know and it's almost like a thread and you can just sort of chase that thread to like wherever it ends or it just kind of unravels and you don't get the idea the feeling of doing both is very different to me at least um and yeah, now these days, if I'm writing with somebody, I usually am just trying to contribute musical stuff. Everybody sees the world in such a specific way. And even I have a hard time with that with my, with like I'm writing, if somebody suggests a lyric, I like sometimes have a hard time committing to somebody else's suggestion because I'm like, I just don't know if it's lines up with my exact feeling about this. But that can also be, I can, it can also be a pain in the ass to be that way because sometimes it, takes a really long time to find the the right lyric or the right thing I guess but yeah I'd say they're different I would say they're they're different for sure kind of going off of that in terms of like collaborating yeah. is there anybody else who performed on this album just for any instruments or vocals yes yeah so this I mean uh the most core musicians on this record are some friends of mine from Nashville my friends Kevin and Tarka and Alex and they played on my first record and when I used to live in Nashville we'd you know just hang out and record demos together all the time of songs which is cool when you have that with people because you can kind of be in the same room and you don't really have to communicate very much you can just start playing and then um yeah and then I, I sort of just for this record asked whichever friends came to mind that I thought would be good for it so I asked Phoebe to sing on a couple of songs um, my friend Eva B. Ross, who's a, a great singer, she sang on a couple songs. My Charlie Hickey, uh, I had him sing on, uh, I think maybe the last song. And I just hit up like my friend Ethan played some guitar and mandolin on it. My other friend Ethan, who produces Phoebe's records, he added a bunch of magical stuff to it. It was also my first time just sort of fully producing something on my own. And it, I used that as an opportunity to be which musician friends of mine could I just ask to, to add something because I like the things they, they do. You know, I like the things they make. My roommate Mason's a great guitar player and he played on it. I think with music in particular, collaboration is just such, a, such an incredible joy and, and like blessing when you, when you have that experience where, you know, everybody offers such a unique thing and and color and you have the opportunity if you're lucky to have the opportunity to know a bunch of different people you can end up with sort of interesting results mm -hmm. so yeah it's, it's as much it's as much uh my record as as it is just everyone who played on it you know? and building off on that as well um like obviously like you just said a big part of your musical career is collaborating with other artists like Phoebe and yeah. I saw that in um like one of the previous interviews you did in an article that was written that you actually contributed a lot to the writing of Demi Moore which is one of my favorite personal songs of hers <laughs> so I kind of just wanted to ask like what is your experiences or takeaways and perspective on working on that song I guess that was like five or six years ago now that we recorded that first record. Mm -hmm. I mean, that song in particular, I don't remember that much other than like we were just sitting outside for producer Tony Berg's old house where we recorded that album. It was mostly that outro. It was really just the outro line that I wrote. She was looking for kind of a repeating like outro, you know, where there would just be a lyric that was repeating and I, I, just suggested that line and she liked it. But that whole record, I mean, the process for every song was kind of similar in the sense that tried a bunch of different ideas for every song until one stuck. Her lyrics are so good that you're kind of naturally just positioned to find ways to support those lyrics musically, you know? And the melodies are so good. So it's this weird mix of easy and challenging where the challenging part is well what thing do I pick to 
sort of try and add that matches that, that that actually adds something because i remember we were making her second record this legendary dr drummer jim keltner came and played on some fun things and he said something about phoebe's music that really resonated with me which he was like you know i'm hearing like this or that on this song but at the same time like one of the things he was like one of the things i love about phoebe's music is i kind of hear these parts in my head and they don't actually have to be there you know so that's kind of the challenging part it's like really good songs will kind of make you dream up of ideas and then you have to pick something or not or sometimes a part of being a musician is just knowing that it doesn't need i don't need to add anything to something you know mm, definitely and i just wanted to um, ask a clarifying question as well did she actually help you with the writing process of linoleum which has come on your upcoming album no so the only there's only one song on the record that i wrote with somebody else i wrote this song i don't know with with charlie hickey uh, okay. but everything else i wrote by myself she just came over and sang on that song in like five minutes. <laughs> and then we watched YouTube videos for a while. <laughs> that was that session. <laughs> That's good. Just going into specifics about actual songs on the album. Um, there's a really good simplicity and beautiful simplicity and like the melodies of um, Any Place I Am and Picture in a Drawer. And also the piano lines are very simple, but there's like a profoundness in that. Um, it's almost like two lullabies. So why did you choose to strip those ones down as opposed to other songs? Well, thank, thank you. I really appreciate that. I feel like I'm not consciously ever trying to make something that's necessarily simple and profound at the same time or, or whatever you know like my favorite thing about like robert frank's photos is that they could sort of just be a, a landscape through a window and it's like super underexposed or something and it's like it's kind of of nothing but it has this like emotional sort of effect on you um and maybe it was just because those songs were more plaintive and like more leaning into you know not leaning into them being sad but also yes like, like just leaning into like the voice of the character feeling sort of regretful or defeated or or looking for something usually a decision like that i usually just rely on whatever just sort of intuitively makes sense a lot of making records is kind of taking a song and trying it in all these different ways. And there are songs on the record where I, you know, probably recorded five different versions of them until I found a version I liked. But those ones, it just always made sense to me that I'm just gonna let them sort of be these piano ballads with just sort of like environmental, like sounds happening around them. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't a super, calculated idea it just felt it just made sense to do that for whatever reason and building off on that as well i've noticed that your songwriting is extremely candid and the lyrics are really the star of the show on your releases which i personally love like my favorite thing is really listening and dissecting to artist lyrics and i kind of just wanted to ask is there any topic or part of yourself that you would refrain from including in your songs or oppositely, I know specifically with Take a Walk from your last album that really helped you kind of come to this realization and work through the depersonalization that came after your trip. So do you feel that songwriting gives you some sort of clarity or power to address certain things that you wouldn't necessarily face if you didn't write a song about it? That's interesting. I mean, I used to think of songwriting more as therapy but that was before I went to therapy and then I realized that they were two very different things like song, song writing about something has never helped me like solve the problem I would say it's more like it can sometimes give you insight on how to solve the problem when you write a song you know it's not like it makes everything okay um, but it can give you insight into you know maybe ways you were thinking about something that you weren't even aware of and as far as like parts of myself that I would refrain from writing about, so much of my songs just happen kind of quickly or just like the lyrics happen based on, you know, if I'm able to sort of cut through the noise and just 
write something at all. I'm not necessarily good at like, I'm gonna write a song about this thing or that thing. You know, it's more like whatever sort of external stimuli is making me feel at that juncture in time that that ends up sort of being the song. Other songwriters that aren't so personal, but you can hear sort of something underneath the lyrics. You know, there's something to be said for all those different styles, I guess. But for me, it always just worked. It felt like it worked to just be as personal as possible. But then you also, you're always changing too. So like if I were to listen to my first record, the perspectives that I was occupying then are completely different to the perspectives I, I have now, you know, like I, made, I wrote those songs when I was like 18 or 20 and they're like kind of, they're very angsty and they're like very accusatory and they're very like angry, but not necessarily for the right reasons. You know, the older I've gotten, the more, the more responsibilities that come up in your life. It's like, yeah, I know you're forced to look at yourself more and be like, okay, all these things are happening in my life and I'm, you know, you sort of realize you're, you're the thing in your life, you're the common denominator. I'm going to play genius lyrics for a minute and ask a lyric question. Yeah. Uh, so in Afraid of Nothing, you have the line, I won't be afraid of nothing. No, I won't be scared of you. So who is that referring to or what is that referring to? I, I honestly don't know. I mean, <laughs> I think maybe... I honestly don't know. Maybe just your past even. Like I, like, I really don't know. That song happens so fast. And it's sort of about like coming out the other end of a really difficult thing. And in some ways, you know, like that is a scary event when like maybe your whole life you say you had like certain coping mechanisms for something and you really relied on those coping mechanisms and it was like a really well-trodden path and you really knew those uh, mechanisms and those ways of thinking even if they were ultimately detrimental to like yourself um, and and when you start choosing to be like okay I'm going to start choosing to like myself more or I'm going to start doing things that make me like myself more it's kind of scary because you rewire these new thought patterns and we know that like the brain is super plastic and we can do that but it's it, you you it's just there's this sense of uh you know if you're on a hiking trail you don't know the trail at first but after you do it a hundred times you you know it really well and it's that sense of just like uncharted territory so it's kind of about that i guess like like you know um not being afraid to take the path that you think is going to help you out, you know, just because it's unfamiliar, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> it could totally be about nothing. And I just, it felt, I think part of it is that it just felt really cathartic to sing that. That was my follow-up question. Was it sounds like something you would chant at like a show? And do you plan on touring or how do you plan for that moment to feel like when you're in front of a crowd? Well, I don't know. I, I end up playing, I've only played that song live like one time and it ends up being like pretty hushed, but um, <laughs> I'll probably tour, I'll probably tour next year at some point. I've recorded kind of everything and then I wanted the end of it to sort of feel like that. So I basically recorded like eight tracks of me, like a microphone at one end of the live room of the studio and I was standing all the way at the back of the other wall like just basically screaming the lyrics um so that's funny yeah because I because that was sort of that was how I was feeling in the moment I was like okay I want to like get this feeling across that it is cathartic so there's like 10 there's like 10 of me on there <laughs> and then also going off of that like you just got off of a tour which is a huge deal after not being able to perform for so long so what was that like it was awesome. I mean, it was intense too. It was like, it was intense to tour after not doing it for a while. It was a little intense on the body. You're not necessarily getting like the best sleep every night. I forgot that traveling in and of itself was weird. And, and it's this weird mix where it's like, you know, to be touring on a bus at all is such a fucking awesome privilege, but it's still, 
it's still weird and it's still you're still not as comfortable as you are when you're just at home i mean it was kind of mind-blowing that we even got through the tour it's funny like you end up getting to this point in tour at least i do where i find myself like maybe un wittingly taking it for granted and I'm in this type space of like okay I want to just I'm ready to get home and the tour ended on a high note which was nice like the, our last few shows were really good shows and and I was really glad to be home when I got home but then I like went and saw Moses Sumney the other night who I'd never seen before and I was just, and it was so amazing and I was just watching like oh, fuck, I wish I was back on tour that looks so fun it's good to I guess take stock of where you're at when you're on tour but yeah it was intense and weird but fun yeah. it was all the all of the things i guess and yeah. i'm sorry we have to be good journalists so yeah. we have to ask about the kiss with you and phoebe at the end of i know the end you just need to yeah. give us all the details if you're comfortable with that yeah well at the i, I think that the it happened literally at the first show on tour where I was like, we're, there's that like obnoxious, like tasteless solo outro. She came over to me and I basically saw that she was like saying, kiss me. And it was just, it just like theatrical making out for fun. Yes. You know? Like Phoebe and I have been like best friends for like fucking nine years at this point. So um, sometimes you just make out with your best friend for fun because it, you know, and people, people thought it was funny too, which, you know. It was so good. It like elevated the end of the performance. And I was like, I did not know the end. I did not expect that coming the out. Tough part, the tough part is making out with somebody while having to play a guitar solo. Yeah. You end up both, <laughs> like, you end up doing both kind of really badly. <laughs> like we kept being like, oh, we're making out like 12 year olds make out. Yeah, that was, that, that, that the tour was, you know, full of silly shit like that. So that, that makes touring fun, you know. And then kind of regressing a little bit with this question, but in previous interviews, it was mentioned that Afraid of Everything was recorded very quickly, actually. I think it was only like the span of a few days. And there was um, kind of a few months left for revision. So I just wanted to ask, like, was that decision intentional? And what were the benefits or oppositely the drawbacks to that? Well, I was just, when I made that record, I was just younger and I just was more like, I was less patient and, and again, less able to edit myself. I was more impatient. So I was like, okay, but I just want to make this record and get it done. The older I've gotten, it's like, you know, this record I spent basically like two years making because I wasn't in any rush, you know, I was like, I, and because I learned to always have always have loved the process of making music. But as I've gotten older, I've learned to love that process even more and really realize that that's the part of it that counts, you know, because once you finish a record, you're like, the fun part is totally over, you know, like the fun part is, is the making of it. So, um, so I think it was that a little bit too, you know, the drawbacks, the, the pros of making something quickly or maybe making decisions that feel like whatever the essential decisions are. The drawbacks are that you might end up hearing those things totally differently a year from, from when you made them. Making something over a longer period of time, you just have more time to sort of gain perspective and be like, oh, you know what, that which is why I was able to record like five different versions of songs because I could make a version and, and like it, but then over the course of five months be like, I don't, I don't like that the way I thought I did initially. You know, it, I feel like it happens in any medium where like you take a photo or something and you think it's, you, know, you have two photos next to each other and you think that one is really good or something, or different things hold up more, I guess, you know, or, or, just feel more powerful later on and other things maybe you're like oh this song I, I'm not as you know necessarily attached to this song as I thought I would be or something or I'm more attached to this one than I thought I would be or this performance or whatever so interesting you say that too because like for me when I'm writing something 
right when I finish it, I kind of like my process is very similar. Like I just bang it out and I'm like, whoa, that felt weird, but good to like let it all out. But then I'll revisit it like a few months later or after it's been published for a bit. And I'm like, oh my God, like, why did I think that was so good? Or why was like that so important to me? And it's really interesting to see kind of like how your perspective and evolving experiences kind of like shape what you take away from it later on yeah. and like what that can contribute. Yeah, and I'm sure you find too that like you also have to allow room to be like, okay, even if maybe I'm not as crazy about this thing, it was probably the best I could do at the time. So it's it's cool when you have that experience, right? Because you're like, oh, it means that I'm my curiosity has evolved and my tastes are still evolved. Like it, it basically is a signal to the fact that the way you think is still evolving. You almost wouldn't want to look at something you wrote six months ago and feel the exact same way about it just kind of general question do you have a favorite favorite track off of the new album and why is it your favorite track I think that it would kind of be a tie between I'd like that song Mechlazine because I just that was one that I was basically not I had wrote like four or five years ago really fast and had made a couple different demos of and kind of was in this headspace of like, I don't really like any of these demos. Like maybe this song's just not very good and I just can't, I just gotta let it go. I can't make it work. And then I was looking for like one more song to add to my record. And I thought, I'm just gonna try. I like, was like, I'm gonna wake up tomorrow and go in the studio and just try one more time to make a version of that song and see if I like it. And I tried an acoustic demo and I tried a piano demo and I tried a different acoustic -y demo. I was like, I'll try and do a piano demo, but maybe this song, because it's so repetitive, maybe it would help if it had like a really steady rhythmic component. So I thought I'll just try it with the drum machine. And because it sort of reminded me that, you know, some, sometimes it does take just like reframing a thing until it sticks. And then I like that song Secret Garden too, because I wrote it kind of as like a love song mm. and I had never really written a love song before. And so I liked that, it, you know, I was able to write a love song. Actually kind of building off on that, my questions like keep referring to your first album and comparing it to this one. But I feel like for me as a listener and just as a music journalist too, I love looking at the evolution between different projects. Yeah. So I know there was a lot of contending tracks when you were deciding the finals for Afraid of Everything. Cool. Um, how many songs didn't make it onto Afraid of Nothing and what is the process for the ones that did stay? Well, it was different because when I made my first record, I had been writing songs for like, you know, five or six years at that point. And I had about, you know, I had like hundreds of songs to choose from and I had whittled that down to like 40 songs to choose from. Mm. And then Marshall helped me pick like nine songs. And then for this one, it was more like, I write a lot more slowly now. I don't write a bunch of songs all the time. I just kind of write when I feel like it. Um, you know, I, I usually am, part of that is just that I'm more involved in other parts of music that aren't writing most of the time. And, and uh, you know, I'm more like as, you know, busy as an instrumentalist, I guess. Um, but in this case, there weren't really, there were maybe a few songs that I had thought about putting on, but most of, basically all the songs that are on this record weren't like up against any other songs. It was kind of like, I, these were just the ones I had sort of, I guess from the time I wrote my first record to making this record, there are tons of songs I've written that didn't make it on this record, but sort of clocked which ones my favorites were. And those are what ended up being this record, you know, like it, like I kind of was always keeping like mental stock of which ones I liked the most. Mm -hmm. um, so, but there are definitely songs that, you know, um, I've recorded, like have versions of that didn't make it, um, but maybe I'll put out 
as something else later on or something if I ever come back to them. Mm. But who knows, who knows, kind of. And that's kind of the beauty of it too, because it's like if you have this idea that you're like, oh, I think it's good, but not right now, you can always pull from it later on for inspiration and it can kind of turn into something that you never even realized it could be in something so much better than it would have been if you kind of like tried to make it fit or work in another circumstance. You could like rework a thing, you know, you like be like, oh, I just like this section of a song or something and I want to put it in this thing. Or I like this melody, but I don't like the words or the music. I'm going to rewrite, you know. Yeah, I like that perspective. So I did notice on Apple Music and I think Spotify too, there's a genre shift um, and the label. So you all your other work was alternative folk and now it does say indie rock. Oh, um, wow. Conscious shift or did you change the label or they just are relabeling you? <laughs> just totally, totally have no part in that shift. Yeah. But I was at dinner with my friend last night with a couple couple friends and uh, one of my friends was like, why isn't uh, post post folk a genre? <laughs> like, oh, that's be I was like, that's what I'll that's what I'll call it. It's it's post folk. But but no, not a conscious shift. I mean I mean it's as much, I guess, alternative folk as it is indie rock. I don't even know, you know. And kind of building off on that, I kind of wanted to ask, like, how are you able to balance your varied music taste with your own creations? Do you feel like there's certain styles that you're able to either pull from or implement into your own work? Or do you feel more inclined to bind yourself to a specific sound? Yeah, it's, it's, I would say the former, like, it's kind of just whatever, wherever I'm at at that moment, and like, whichever records I'm stoked on or sounds I'm interested in just kind of chasing those and maybe even subconsciously a little bit writing to that idea like writing to whatever thing I'm interested at the time sonically every record has such a different sort of blueprint of what it is sonically and um and that was part of why I wanted to make a record that I self-produced and self-engineered too because it was an opportunity to be like all right I want to you know, I have really specific sounds I want to try and make happen. So I'm just going to do that and, and see if it works. And then since then, I've gotten to produce some other people's stuff too. And I love, I just love that process of just like getting sounds and, and you know, I, I just, it's like it's endless fun to me to be able to do that. You must be able to read my screen because that's like a perfect lead into like the last question I have for you today. Um, okay. And I kind of just wanted to, first of all, compliment how your songs mainly highlight just like your beautiful vocal abilities. I think you have such a unique voice and it really adds depth to your songs. There are just some very amazing production details that really elevate the impact that it has on a listener. So do you feel there is anything in the production or revision process, like for example, overdubbing something that conveys something that a raw track alone can't? And do you have any favorite details to add when you're doing the production or mixing for a song? I think that the difference, like, I think that obviously the core of the song will like buy it, whatever the production is. But I do think the way a song is received changes based on the production. So if something is really pared down, it might prime you to, you know, listen more closely to this one song because there's less happening, you know. It's almost like that trick of even in a live show, like if people aren't listening, you don't want to get louder, you want to actually get quieter because it makes people more aware of their own, vo the volume of their own voices. As far as like specific production details, it's, it's a mix of going through the trials of like, I guess the best way to answer that question is maybe to take like a specific song. So that song, there's a song on the record called Linoleum. And when I first wrote it, I made this like iPhone demo of it that was like really sort of roomy and lo-fi and like the, the door was open and you could hear like uh, neighbors at a friend's apartment and like children and things. And, and it was its own thing that I was really attached to. And then I tried for fun to like make this sort of band version of it with maybe not losing the spirit of the song. 
you just try different things based on wherever your imagination is at at the time, I think. And, and a lot of it too does depend on maybe the other musicians you get involved because they're going to add a thing that maybe you weren't hearing that becomes an exciting production detail. Um, and a lot of it comes from, you know, experiences that you have in the past where it's like, okay, I'm going to introduce this thing here as like an elevation or, uh, or I'm going to, cut this thing out in this section to provide some sort of dynamic shift. It's always just sort of a random throwing paint at the wall thing. It's like addition and subtraction game that you play with. If it gives you a feeling, if it gives you a, a sense that there's something about it that feels right, you know, or a sense that there's something about it that it should be there. You know, because you know pretty fast if you add something, you add, that doesn't need to be there. But it feels very in intuitive to, to sort of uh, try and be cognizant of that, I guess. Like just sort of this intuitive sense of what production details make it exciting to you, you know. And, and a lot of that for me probably comes down to just the records I love. So um, there always are going to be certain sounds that I, that I like because I love, you know, the white album or something like there's going to be certain guitar sounds that I like because of that or you know because of a Jackson Brown album or, or honestly like I've learned a lot from making Phoebe's records about um, production from from her producer Tony Berg like I've learned so much because he's this guy that just has this sort of encyclopedic knowledge of all music so he's constantly thinking about production as well in terms of what else it's referencing, sort of just like the pantheon of music, as well as how can it be different? I guess the answer I'm trying to come to is that a lot of production is almost like your opportunity to um, like acknowledge your favorite record, as well as hopefully give, give it its own thing that, that you wish that those records kind of did or something. Thank you.